that mean? And what is God doing? Right? In a macro picture, like in a bigger picture, God, what are you doing and why are you rallying the church around the nations right now? Okay, what is happening? So I want to kind of look at some of those. <laughs> and so in Esther 3 here, would you know many of the story of Esther, Esther becomes the queen okay, of, of this of, uh, uh, here. And it's really, it's in ancient uh, Iran. Okay? It's the citadel of Susa right, with King, uh, I forget his name, Ahus, Ahusaras. Or, right? And so he, he promotes Haman. <coughs> and Haman in chapter 3, he promotes him. Uh, to really be his right hand guy, to be have authority in the nation, and he establishes him. Verse one, and he advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who are with him. All the king's servants who are at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had command, commanded concerning him. It says, but Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. And so Mordecai doesn't bow down to Haman, and it irritates Haman. I mean, he's angry about it because of his own pride. But there's a reason why Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman, and this is the bigger issue. It says, uh, <coughs> uh, when we keep reading, uh, it says, Then the king's servants who are at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him and he would not listen to them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand. Here it is. For he had told them that he was a Jew. The reason he wouldn't bow down was because he was a Jew, meaning he was to be separate. Right? Just like Daniel and his friends. They were to be separate and not to bow down to the gods of other nations. This was the biggest issue. It's because he was separate and he was a Jew. And so when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. Right? <coughs> and then it says, But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Okay. Right. And then this gets reported. Okay. And in verse 8, so the Haman now is talking to the king, and he's, you know, he's setting it up so that he can destroy the Jews. And here's his reasoning in verse 8 to the king. He says, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. And so if it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put them into the king's treasury. And he put them into the king's treasuries. <clears throat> and so the king gives them the approval. But the reason why, and it struck me, that this attack against the Jews is because actually God set them apart. From the very beginning, when he called them, he set apart the Jews in both their religion, okay, and their in the way that we're not supposed to intermarry, okay, in their uh, social practices. You know, he set them apart, and even though they were scattered over the centuries, they maintained their language, their culture, their religion, okay, and they were separate. And being separate unto God actually right, is, the, is the place where the rub is, and it makes them distinct. Right? And this separation is actually the, is where the accusation against the Jews came. <clears throat> and even now, when you look through the nations, everyone knows right, the Jews are God's chosen people. Right? Whether they like it or not, they, most people know that. And so here, this... this uh, Haman uses this, makes a decree, has it sent out now, and there's a certain date in which you know, all the Jews are to be killed. Right? And we know the story of Esther, and so obviously Esther is Jewish. 
Okay, she was raised by Mordecai, uh, and when Queen Vashti, I think it's Vashti, didn't, uh, wouldn't listen to the king, okay, um, I was reading that, and I had all these thoughts when I was reading about Queen Vashti. I was like, anyway, sorry, I just, my brain just went somewhere else. <laughs> but um, uh, there's so many, like, sermons on marriage on that, out of that uh, relationship. But anyway, because um, <laughs> we just did the marriage this morning, so I was just, uh, but when she, you know, when she didn't obey, um, they brought another queen in, and it was Queen Esther, and Esther uh, became the queen, and so, but she was a Jew, okay? And so Mordecai finds out about this plot by Haman, okay? He tears his clothes because there's a decree for all the Jews, okay? In their whole province, all the provinces, in the whole kingdom, that all the Jews are to be killed. And it was actually uh, by the king's decree because of what Haman did. And so when Mordecai finds out, he, he tells Esther, and Esther's like, what am I supposed to do? And I can't just enter the king's, servant, enter the king's court. All right? You could die. If he doesn't extend the scepter, you would die. And so she's going back and forth with Mordecai. <coughs> and here in chapter 4, okay, let's look at verse um, 13. It says, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you are in the king's palace, that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And, and who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Meaning, God raised her up and put her in this place for this specific moment and for this time. Right? And I think I liken that too to the body of Christ, this royalty that we have that God has placed us now, that we're born for a time such as this now, so that we can actually lift our voice and not be silent. Okay? We can lift our voice and not be silent. So then Esther, uh, verse 15, told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, n night or day, and I and my maidens will also fast in the same way and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. <clears throat> and so she said she's going to fast and prepare. And then she will go into the king, really, which is a form of intercession. She's going to intercede on behalf of the Jews. And the story is she does. She goes and, and, um, and the king receives her. And she reveals that it was actually Haman who was who was trying to kill the Jews, and the king makes this decree, and he actually spares the Jews, and then he gives them authority to kill all of Haman's, the people that are against them, including Haman's 10 sons, who actually get hanged on the gallows that uh, Haman prepared for Mordecai, right? the story of Esther. <coughs> and so in it, we're, going, we're looking just at what's happening in the nations, and you look at the, the struggles and the, and the things that are happening with Israel, and it's this Esther moment in this sense that the believers, the Gentile church, has access to the king of heaven. Right? We have access to the king of glory, and that we can petition and we can ask in fasting and in prayer, saying, Lord, turn and deliver the Jewish people. Turn and deliver the Jewish people. Okay? And I think what's going to happen, whether it's, it's this in May, because whatever happens in May, this isn't the end of the story. There is a final Antichrist that's going to arise. And there is a final deliverance <coughs> that, that the Jews need in which Jesus returns to deliver them, but in partnership with the church at that time, with the Gentile church. And so when I look at it, I go, I think this story of Esther or, the, or the, uh, the crisis and the Esther moments, I think they're actually going to replay numerous times from now to when they're finally delivered when Christ returns. Okay? I think it's going to happen over and over again, meaning there's going to be other crises or crises that come to the Jewish people and the global church will intercede and stand for Israel's deliverance in different ways. 
because Israel will not be, uh, they won't be destroyed, okay? they won't be annihilated, they're going to be here, that's the first point. The second point is, they won't be a global power in that sense, um, the, the Antichrist and his armies are going to come and attack Israel. Okay? We know that's going to happen. <clears throat> the third point I believe is this, is that the, the, the power, when you look at the end time storyline, what we see is there is a shifting of power in the nations. Okay? Right now the power is in the, is in the West. Before America is as the, as the empire, the greatest empire in the world now, before America, it was Great Britain. Okay? It was Great Britain, okay? and then now it's America. But when we look at the storyline of the end, we actually don't see the West or those powers in the story at the end of the age. It's actually centered around the Middle East and Eastern nations. And what that tells us is that the, the power base of the nations is going to shift from the West, where it is now, to the Eastern nations, I believe. Okay? In the West right now, it's like the G7, right? these nations in the G7, economically, militarily, politically. Right? It's, they actually is, are the nations that help uh, control uh, all of the legislation and things like that in the nations. And I believe that is shifting right now. I believe it's, it's shifting very fast. Okay? And so that's one point of things going. When you look at the end time storyline, the power base has to shift from the west to the east. Okay? From the west to the east. And what that means is, I think for us in the west, there's actually going to be disruption and changes in our lives. There's going to be disruption and changes in many, many levels in our lives in the west, including America. <clears throat> right? um, and so then, if that's the case, it's like, why, why does, is this continuing to happen okay, with Israel? And here's my thought. I think these Esther moments will continue because Israel is the context, in a greater sense, what happens with Israel, it's the context for the maturing of the church. Now, what happens with Israel, the church is going to be brought into... And as greater crises happen, and the church gets herself involved in her deliverance, in her intercession, in love for her, right, in protecting her, in providing for her, well, I believe what will happen is it will cause the church to mature and for the church to begin to learn our authority and the place of prayer and fasting. Right? That, that's the shift that has to happen. And I think we have a very Western view of what the church looks like and how we operate. And that's not wrong. It's just that's where we are. But I think a lot of those things are going to shift. And the maturing of the church, it's actually going, where is our authority? It's not how much money we have. Okay? It's not in our political clout. It's actually our, it's like with Esther, we have access to the king. We know how to move things in the heavens we know the truth of the Bible, and we're standing for that truth, and we're seeing the authority that God's given the church, especially in prayer and fasting and worship and declaration of the word. And I believe that this, the context of Israel and the pressures around Israel, because it will only increase. <clears throat> it will only increase, and the global church will not be able to escape that storyline. We won't. And even if we wanted to, and I believe God's, God was going to draw the church to embrace Israel, and as we do, it's going to mature the church, the global church, it's going to mature her as we engage in the fight for Israel. Okay? And I think, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why... Um, that context is it's not going to go away, and it's actually going to cause us to have to engage, and it's going to bring our lives in. <clears throat> now, when we look at Iran, all right, Iran is raising up right now, and really, when we look pro prophetically, Iran is pro most likely going to have control over the Middle East. 
right, in Daniel 8, Iran is going to be a power in the Middle East. Okay? And then there's going to be the nation probably of Turkey that will rise to attack Iran. But you look, and what's missing or what we don't know is going to happen is what is happening with Israel in the midst of that? Because the Bible's silent in some ways on that. In many ways, what we know is the political powers or empires are rising in the Middle East. But what we don't know is what is happening with Israel because it's silent. But then what we see is out of, out of the goat or Turkey, what we actually see is the ten nations coming out and the Antichrist coming forth who will attack Israel. And we don't see exactly where Israel is in that, in that time until she's attacked. <coughs> okay. And I think in the midst of it, what will happen is that many uh, these pressures, these different crises, will actually come on a global level. Okay. And what will happen is it will actually draw in both the church and the nations multiple times. Okay. I mean, there's people that believe right now that even possibly this year, that, that there could be a World War III started this year. Okay? Because with Iran having the bomb, getting the bomb, okay, Israel's looking at a preemptive strike. Okay? They're looking at a preemptive strike. Because they're not going to let Iran just blow them up. We don't know how, you don't, don't know how serious they are. But they've, this isn't out of character. They did, they've done preemptive strikes before in their history. Okay? <clears throat> and so there, there's some people that's going, there could be a third world war this year. Okay, this year it could happen. Right? We don't know, but it's possible. So what that means is things are escalating. Things are escalating pretty fast. Okay? And I think what it does is it will change, um, especially in the West for us, it will change many dynamics about how our nation is and, and what our nation's going to do, okay? And it's like, I, I think there's a lot of changes coming and I think it's coming rapidly and I think we're on a very accelerated pl place right now for this shifting of power from the, from the west to the east. Right? And I, think, I don't think most people even understand it or are aware of it, but, but I think it's going to shift so many things uh, about our, uh, the way we live. I think it's going to be foundational to the way we live. So I'm not saying it's gloom and doom, okay, but we're, we're going to have some very rough times. Okay? I think we're going to have some very, and there's a number of things that are happening right now, um, but I think we're going to have some very rough times going forward. <coughs> and I think it's a time for us to go, God, what are you doing and what are you saying outside of our little world, okay, either, you know, like in Sarasota and all that, or even outside of America. I think to get the right picture of what God is doing and how we're to prepare and how we're to engage, I think we have to get outside of the Western view or the view of America, the American view. And I think that's hard, but I think we have to get outside of that to go, okay, what is, what is God allowing or what is he doing in the nations right now? Because what he's doing in the nations is bigger than America, even though we're a major part of it. But I think it's way bigger. And then the next question is, Lord, what does that mean for us? How do we prepare as the church? Because God brings bases judgment, right? First, on where the church's activity is at, on the church, and then also surrounding God's purposes for Israel. And so it's like, it's, that's different than patriot, uh, American patriotism, okay, and even our way of life. And I said that, I and mean, we're Americans, but it's hard to fathom that, but those aren't the standards by which God moves or judges by. <coughs> and so when I, when I look, I go, I go like, let's take, um, I've been really going, Lord, this thing with, um, uh, Asbury, okay? The Lord touching Asbury this year. Now, first time in 40 years. Okay? And I know we're praying for uh, awakening, revival. So many people are praying for that. And I think what's really interesting about Asbury is this. Obviously, it's sovereignly, God did it, okay? Uh, but one, it's touching young adults, primarily young adults in other colleges. 
Number two, it's in a non-charismatic setting. Okay, Asbury wasn't isn't a charismatic school. Okay, it's in a non-charismatic setting. Three, charismatics especially are, were flocking there so that they can take it back, take it back, because they, they're hungry to see, I don't, not in a bad way, in a good way, to see the move of God. And really, if you look nationally, it, no one took it back. I mean, right? It, there's nothing flaring up anywhere in a good way about the move of God. And I go, well, that's interesting. Like, you know, why, why didn't it? Right? Why didn't it? And if it didn't, then God, what are you saying and doing that you're touching our young adults and college and high school level, really, that age group? What does that mean? Right? I think those are the questions I'm going, God, what does that mean for us as a nation? And when we see, I think historically, when we see revival awakening, especially many of them were college age, okay, when we see them historically, really what that means is, and I think we're going to see more revivals like that, okay? Um, because usually when it happens, it happens in the midst of a, of, a, of a greater context where the Lord is moving through our nation, right? And that's usually what, whether it's in the 70s, okay, whether in the early 1900s, uh, different in the 1800s. It's the Lord's moving through our nation, but it's, specific, it's focused on that age group. And historically, when we look at it, when it does, that means right up ahead, there's always been war that's come forth. There's, a, there's been a war. Okay. And so it's like when you look and go, Lord, why are you just touching that? Because when you look, all right, the people that were flocking to Asbury, okay, were, there are some young people, but most of them were older people. Right? There are a lot of older charismatics there because I would say, uh, our generation, so the generation above, they missed a lot. Of, there wasn't really a revival in, that, in their generation. And it was promised. A lot of more promise that the revivals are coming. And I think they're going, no, we're after this. We want it. We want to see it. We want to see it. We want to bring it. And a lot of older people went to go look at it and, 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 there and to bring it back, which I'm going to say, it's not bad. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just, right? When I just, I'm just, my observation, just watching. <laughs> And I go, and really the Lord didn't bless that, you know, like taking it back type thing, right? Like, um, like Toronto or something like that. And so, uh, and so when you look at that, going, Lord, why are you touching our young people? We want them touched. But more than just we want them, Lord, you're doing something. What are you saying in the midst of that? And in one way, I go, that's an ominous sign, a good sign, but an ominous sign that there's something ahead ahead possibly for our nation, okay? Possibly for our nation. <coughs> and so we're looking at this, and so I think the bigger picture is going, okay, Lord, we want to enter into this fast for Israel. Yes, there's, Israel needs deliverance and salvation, but there's going to be more things coming up. Okay? And if there is, then what is this for? And I think what it is is, it's, 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 going, it's God's way of saying we need to mature the body of Christ. Okay? It's his way. Because not just with this fast, but I think with this fast and then things that are coming up, I think the pressures in the West and in our nations are going to increase and some of it can be increased really rapidly. Okay? There's a lot of uh, just events that are happening uh, globally that's going to hurt America, hurt our nation. <laughs> and so, like, if you, if you haven't heard this, I don't want to get into all this, but uh, if you haven't heard this, I would just have to say, go check out this thing called, have you heard BRICS? BRICS, B-R-I-C-S? Yes. Okay. All right. The, and so it's, uh, it's a, it's a uh, group of nations, and um, it's, you know, it's called BRICS. They've been around since, like, 2013-ish, right? But it's Brazil, Brazil, right? <coughs> Russia, India, China, and South Africa, okay, these five nation groups, right? And, they, and they're, they've come together to work and things like that. But I, I, if you just research it a little bit, like this, what Mike was saying, it's all over, right? And I go, I would encourage you to research some of this because right, it, it's very tenuous right now, okay? And a lot of things are, on, I think, on the precipice, meaning a lot of things can change in our nation. 
And I think it will. Right? Even biblically, eschatologically, I think it will. And so it's going, okay, Lord, how do we prepare? How do we set our heart? Okay? You know, it's not, and the other thing is like, because, so I say that, and then, <coughs> uh, and then the other thing is, you know, we have this, right, even like, just like Israel, the political cr- climate in our nation is just, is so bad. So much division and so much um, just animosity and attacking. And now we're going to come up into another presidential season that's coming, okay? And just tonight I was listening, I was like, I just felt like the Lord say, this, this season of this presidential 2024, I think is actually going to be a distraction for the body of Christ in America. It's actually, meaning we, it's not that we shouldn't vote and we shouldn't be engaged, but all the things that happen around it. You'll wa- watch, there's going to be so many prayer events for the Republican nominee. Okay? And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just going, you watch, look at all the energy that's going to come out. All the he said, the accusations, and all of this thing that's going to happen. You thought the last one was bad. Okay? I think it's going to be worse. And I think it's actually a distraction for the body of Christ. Okay? It's not that we shouldn't be Americans. We shouldn't vote. There's a place for that. But beloved, we're not of this world. Okay? We're part of a greater kingdom, a different kingdom. Okay? And I think we have to maneuver that gently and going, yes, we're Americans, but this is the questions I think we have to ask. Going, what does it mean for us? Okay? And I think the political climate is going to get worse and worse and worse. And I think what it's doing, it's sucking in believers without knowing it into that same, same spirit, same attitude, same, same viewpoints, you know? And also, it's just, they're just fighting and going, but that's not what we're about. It's not saying we shouldn't engage in, in politics, we shouldn't have offices, and we shouldn't, you know, it's very important, okay? But there's a right way to do that. Okay? And I think the last two elections, it's been, it's been, it's gotten worse and worse, and I look at this one, I go, I think it's going to be way worse. And, and I think it's actually a distraction for us. There's going to be so much time and energy spent on all these things. Instead, you're, I think we have to step back and go, God, what are you saying for the body of Christ globally? Like globally, not, Amer- not America, the church in America. Globally, going, how do we participate in that? And then it's like, okay, then what does it mean for me and my family? How do we engage in this? Okay? How, do we, you know, how do we grow in this and for what's, what's going to happen? And so, I, so when I think of this Israel fast, I mean, I know I'm kind of giving a bigger picture. I think these are things that are all wrapped up with Israel. Right? When I look at Israel, I go, yes, we love Israel. Yes, the covenants with Israel. Okay? But it's like, but you look and go, Israel really is what God uses, that nation, by his election to actually bring about his full purposes. It's his wisdom. And in doing that, we're like, why is this happening now? And even if they don't have civil war, or even if they beat Iran, what does that mean? Like, what's going to happen? Because there are going to be more points coming up as we escalate. And so when you see that, you're like, okay, Lord, what are you saying? And I think those are questions to ask, you know, outside of just our daily lives, going, Lord, what are you saying to us as a body, as the bride of Christ, as a global church? Lord, what are you doing? How do we engage in that? How do we engage in that? <coughs> okay. I think you have something. Right? Do you have something you want to share? You can if you want. So just um, going on with the um, idea of the of the church, because if you caught even Mike was saying it's you know these intercessors, it's the Gentiles interceding and um, if you go to the book of Ruth so we're gonna hit our other I didn't keep my marker in here Um, we go into the book of Ruth because so you have Esther you know the story of Esther and and remember the New Testament says the Old Testament shadows and types we are to learn from it there it's more than just Oh, those were stories that happened 
uh, we draw we can draw from it the truth so you have this truth of Esther as being the intercessor coming before really a Gentile king so she's a Jew coming to the Gentile king and then we get in the book of Ruth it's actually the reverse we have a Gentile going I'm gonna come and be grafted into Israel and as we, um, I just want to ch- take just a brief look at the book of Ruth um, in, a, in, a, in this allegorical sense of the church being grafted into Israel. And if we look at Ruth, she's a Moabitess. Um, many of you know the story. I'll just give the brief. You have Naomi and her husband. There's a famine in Israel. They go to Moab to get food, essentially, and they're living in Moab. She has two sons. Remember, Israel is not supposed to intermarry. They're not supposed to. Really, they shouldn't have gone to Moab. <laughs> if, technically speaking, if you listen to law, they should not have been in Moab. But they go to Moab. Their sons take Moabitess wives. Her husband dies, her sons die, and there's no children. Okay? And in Israel, for the family, is the children got the land. Wealth is land. And they had tribes, and God allotted each tribe their land. And this is how the land stayed within the tribes of Israel, so that Israel wasn't just all portioned, portioned up. So Naomi is now in Moab. She's lost everything. She's got these two, in a sense, Gentile heathen um, daughter-in-laws. And Naomi's like, I'm going back to Israel. She's like, I'm going to go back home and go back to Bethlehem. And she tells her daughter-in-laws, look, I have nothing for you. You stay here, you're young, go get married and have your life here in Moab. And as you know, the story is Ruth refuses to go. And in chapter one, we're we're familiar with this verse because it gets put on plaques and, and all these things. But I want you to look at it as the stance of of who we are as, as Gentile believers. Um, and so we're in chapter 1 and r- verse 16. It says, but Ruth says, and she's talking to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. So here we have Ruth, and and she's going, I'm not leaving you. And furthermore, it's not that I'm just not leaving you. I'm actually, I'm going to go to Israel with you, and I'm going to leave my culture behind. I am, I'm not taking any of my idols from Moab. I'm actually going to worship your God. And if you, if you look at this as Gentiles, as being grafted into the promises of God, when we receive Christ as our Savior, that's what we're saying. We're leaving the paganism of the Gentile nations behind, and we're aligning ourselves with the God of Israel. His name is the God of Israel. And, and he says, I like, this is my name forever, is the God of Israel. And as Gentiles, I think, I mean, we lose some of that in a, in, a, in a sense, I think, especially in America, because we tend to not have as many cultural traditions as we used to have. But when you're coming from another nation and you're leaving a culture, when, when, like when Muslims become believers, they're, leave, they're leaving a God behind them, a whole culture of, of Islam behind them. But, but just as Ruth did, and if you notice too, she's going, where you die, I will die. And, and what catches me in this thing is, is as Gentile believers, as the church, this is our position as Ruth. And Naomi's name means bitter, she's old, she's barren, she can have no children. There's no fruitfulness in her. She is a sense, and she even says, I've been stricken of God. And if we look at Israel at the time when Jesus came and they rejected the Savior, essentially they're like, they've rejected their fruitfulness as a nation. They cannot bring the Messiah back. Israel in and of themselves cannot do it. We'll look in in Romans, and I'll show you where Paul says that. 
But Israel cannot. They are been, they've been a hardening of their hearts is upon them. There's a veil over their eyes. Israel is in this embittered state. They feel like God has rejected them. Many of them rejected God. They're in uh, their own secularism. Um, they are without God. They are lost, even though they're Jews. In this place where the Gentile church stands as Ruth is we're going to Israel and we're saying, no, Israel, we will not leave you. Now, right now, you don't really get much kickback from it, okay? But the reason why the Lord's going, look, get your heart into this. Ask for revelation because there's going to be days ahead where we're going to go, are we willing to give our lives for what God gave his life for. He goes, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. And as, as Gentile believers, we are not here for ourselves. We're actually here to wash the feet of Israel. We're to be a Ruth to Israel. And, and, to, and I mean, just her tenacity of, of even going, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. And... Um, and these parts, and then when we go to the end of Ruth, we know there's Boaz, Ruth, who's a kinsman to Naomi. Ruth um, and Boaz get married, and um, and then if you pick up on chapter four, verse four, uh, end of thirteen, it says the Lord enabled Ruth to conceive. She gives birth to a son. Now I want you to to <laughs> tap into this. Ruth is a Gentile. Gent, it, she. Real, I mean, God really said, do not intermarry. I mean, that was the law. But here Ruth is. She, Boaz marries her. I mean, God blesses this union to the degree that this is David's great-grandmother. Okay? It's amazing. Like, just, you see the salvation of the, Jew, of the Gentile nations here. But Ruth has a boy. <laughs> but the women say to Naomi... Okay, so here's Naomi. She comes back from Moab. She loses her husband, her son. She has nothing. She's really a disgrace. People look at Naomi. She's dumb. She's like, I'm embittered. I've been cursed by God. There's no fruitfulness left in me. Now, now Ruth has a, as, as a child, the women come to Naomi in verse um, 14 here. It says, blessed is the Lord who has not left you. Now, this, they're speaking of her son. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. I mean, this is prophesying Jesus. And she's going, look, God is going to use the Gentile believers for a redeemer for Israel, and his name will be famous in Israel. May he also be to you speaking to Naomi, speaking to Israel, a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, that Gentile woman who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. And then let's skip down. It says um, in verse 17, it says, the neighbor women gave the son a name. And then, <laughs> and then here's the neighbors going, a son has been born to Naomi. And when I read that, I go, no, a son has been born to Ruth. <laughs> I mean, but that wasn't, the, I mean, they are celebrating. They go, no, a son has been born to Naomi. The, the joy that we have as Gentile believers in serving Israel, and head on over to Romans 11 here real quick, is that that day, I mean, when we are interceding for Israel, we are carrying the gospel Paul says we have now been entrusted with the gospel, to carry the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news that the king is coming, that there's a king who will be sitting in Zion, enthroned, fulfilling the, prophecy, the Davidic prophecy. We're saying, Israel, your redeemer is coming. He is, of, he is King David. He is the son of David. And as the Gentile church, we carry this, in Isaiah, it says, comfort Israel. Who? Who's going to comfort Israel? 
I mean, you, sometimes you have to ask yourselves, comfort you, comfort you, Israel. Who? Israel, comfort Israel? He goes, no, Gentile believers, comfort Israel that I'm coming for her. That she is going to have a son. He's going to be a redeemer. He's going to restore life to her. And, and in that sense, when we, as Gentiles, when we're calling out, even that Maranatha call, come, Lord Jesus, come. I mean, when Jesus comes, the rejoicing that will be break forth in the sense the Gentile believers become the womb in which Jesus is birthed onto the earth, and the rejoicing is Israel has her Savior. It's not Iraq has her savior. America has her savior. No, Israel's savior has returned. The God of Israel is here. And that's that prophetic picture that we see from Ruth's life is it's not about Ruth. It wasn't about Ruth. It was about Ruth being that in that sense, that intercessor, that carrier of the seed for Israel. So that Israel would have a redeemer, that King David comes to Israel. The king comes. And as the Gentile church, we're going, what is, it's that we carry the seed so the king comes to Israel. And if you look here in in, um, Romans 11 here real quick, in verse 12, it says, now, if they're, Paul's talking about Israel. Now, if Israel's transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? He's going, look, Gentiles. It's actually, I mean, this is why it says at the end of this, oh, the riches, oh, the wisdom of God. Who can understand his, his thoughts? He's going, look, Israel's rebellion and sin gave you salvation, Gentiles. That's what Paul's saying. Because they rebelled and because they failed and they did not receive the Messiah, Gentiles, you've been blessed. You've been blessed through their sin. And then Paul is very clear. I'm speaking to you, Gentiles. And then if you um, go to verse 15, it says, For if Israel's rejection of Jesus is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And this, this phrase here, their acceptance be life from the dead, put in there the second resurrection. What will their acceptance be when they finally say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? It's whew, the resurrection. We're ushered into the next age. He goes, look, their rejection brought you reconciliation, but Gentiles... Believers, the nations, you pray for Israel. You serve Israel. Give your life for my heart over Israel because when they accept me, that's going to usher you into the next age. Amen? I mean, it's not, it, there, this isn't just this, hey, we're, we're just great, Jesus, you and me, Jesus, and I die and I go to heaven. He's like, no, you don't understand, Gentiles. This, this, in the sense, this cycle is going to keep continuing until you Gentiles begin to cry out for Israel. And so when, when we see this stirring right now and we see this coming together of intercession for Israel, God's going, my son is coming soon. He is preparing. It's a maturing of the bride because that's part of his promise. He's going to mature the bride. But this, this is, he's going, nations, I mean, all these words about globalization and all these things. God's going, I'm bringing my church together all around the globe to cry out my heart. He goes, this is about my heart. It's about my love for Abraham and my covenant that I made with him. It's about my name, God of Israel, being fame all in the nations. And so from, from that point, if we look at why are we praying for Israel? Why are we even fasting for Israel? Who cares about Israel? Like, I want to go and witness to this person. And, and God's going, that's, that's fine. But, but Gentiles, I, I, their failure brought you reconciliation for one purpose, serve Israel. Will you be the Ruth that Israel needs? Will you be that womb on which Jesus is birthed into the earth, that the king can come so that, they, that we can say the God of Israel is now enthroned in Zion? 
I mean, that is, in a sense, the macro purpose of the Gentiles being saved. And then we go over to verse 28. It says, from the standpoint of the gospel, Israel or enemies, why? For your sake. I mean, Paul goes, for your sake, God has made Israel an enemy of the gospel. Now, now figure that one out. Enemy of the gospel of what we're preaching, but Israel's an enemy of it? And Paul goes, yes, from the standpoint of God's choice, though, Israel's beloved for the sake of the fathers. He goes, look, when you guys look at it in your, in your view, you're going, but Israel's contrary to the gospel. I mean, there, there are the Orthodox Jews in Israel persecute the believers. And they, they passed a, they're trying to pass through the Knesset a anti-evangelism law in Israel. They, they do not like the gospel. And, and, Paul, and Paul's going, look, from your view, from the view of the gospel going forth, they're your enemy. But from God's eyes, they're beloved. And so whose eyes do we need? We need our Father's heart. It will not just happen. This is beyond romanticism. When the persecution, when the Holocaust was happening, many in the church looked away. It was because it meant your own death. And Ruth goes, no, where you go, I'll go. Are you going to the concentration camps? Are you being dispersed in the nations? Where you die, I'll die. That's serving Israel unto death. Because this is the reality. Jacob's trouble is going to come. And where is the church? How is she going to comfort Israel if she's going like this? Well, that's Israel. And God's going, no, no, I'm preparing you now. You've got to have my standpoint. They're beloved. And not just beloved, it's going to usher in the next age. And, and this is our privilege as priests before God, but as the Gentile church, this is our privilege, is we get to wash the feet of Israel. We get to serve, in a, in a sense, our older brother. We can to serve the one that, that left the father's house, and we can go, no, let's serve. Let's serve Israel. And so when we... Um, so and when we talk about this fast, I mean, there's all the global things as well. I don't understand half the things Roger talks about in, in that sense. But what I do know, I want my Jesus back. Like, I want to see in this generation. I want my kids to see in this generation. I'm like, God, don't let another generation go by. Let it happen in this generation. Why not this generation? Why not... Why not have Jesus enthroned in Zion in this generation? Why not see Jerusalem restored? And, and that's when I, when I get that picture and I go, and where am I? I go, oh, I'm the Ruth. I'm the Ruth. I can do this. You know, and who cares that at the end of the age, it's all about the Messiah of Israel has returned. I'm sure Ruth wasn't going, wait a minute, it's my kid. I mean, she didn't even name her kid. And it, and it says in there that, that Naomi took the baby and nursed the baby. I mean, it is that privilege as the Gentiles where we go, yes, Israel, here's your king. Here's your king. And, and we see Israel restored. I mean, of course, we're all caught up and we're part of the bride as well. But there is that place. So I just encourage... Um, we really want to encourage, it's just our heart as a leadership here is, is to really press in beyond, beyond just romanticism, beyond just human emotions at the moment, but really to press in for, God, give me this revelation of your heart when, when the times aren't so easy. Like, let, let me love Israel um, the way you do. Let me see my place as a Gentile believer in the, in the preciousness of the gospel and what you've given us to um, endure. Okay, you want to come back up? Oh, we're ending. <laughs> so Keith is going to end. So let's stand up. And, and the other thing I really, uh, I think it's, it's another real aspect. If this is true, and if the Gentiles are provoking the Jews to jealousy and ushering in really Israel's promises and the second coming of the king of, of Jesus 
we have an adversary. We have an adversary. And he does not want the church to lay hold of these truths. So I want to encourage you, push through in a sense there are a lot of times when, when you need revelation in Israel, it's easy. I mean, I find myself, you can, get, you can open the scripture and be like, it's not connecting, it's not making sense. Tiredness, this kind of brain fog, I call it. it push through, rebuke the enemy. He, do, he does not want understanding with Israel because he knows that it's his demise. He hates Israel. Israel's the apple of God's eye. He hates Israel. Israel. And so we just, I want to encourage us if it's hard and you're going, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. I'm not getting, stick with it. Stick with it. Push back. You know, like I said, especially tiredness, there's that stupor that can come on. Um, But let's just, let's just come before the father right now. And let's just ask father, you, you say you give good gifts to your children. And we just stand as, as Gentile believers. We thank you Father, for your extension of salvation to us, these riches of the gospel.